Hello everyone and welcome to this research methods video on reliability and validity. Now chances are most of you will have heard the terms reliability and validity in your psychology lessons quite a lot already. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure that everybody actually knows what the two terms mean and we're going to have a little look at assessing and also improving validity and reliability in psychological research. Now because of that the video is going to be quite long um, so I'm actually going to split it into two sections and make two separate videos out of it. Okay so this first section is going to be all about explaining, assessing and improving reliability and then section two is going to be all about doing the same for validity. Okay, here we go. First off, reliability. What is it? Um, it is essentially a measure of consistency. So the idea is, if I can measure something more than once and get the same result, then that measurement is considered reliable. So if you take, for example, a ruler, and a pencil and if I wanted to measure the length of that pencil I will know that my ruler is consistent and reliable if I get the same measurement every time I measure it. There should only be a change in the measurement if there is a change in the object. Okay, So if I sharpen my pencil and it gets shorter then the object has changed and therefore the length will change. Okay, but if nothing changes in the object, then the length of it should remain consistent. Now in psychology, it's the same thing. If a test or a measure is used to assess something like IQ, for example, um, the score on one particular day should be the same as a score on a different day as well, unless the things that we're measuring has changed. So in this sense, unless the people that we are measuring or the people that we are testing have changed, in which case the scores might change. Now one of the problems that psychologists tend to have is that they're not really interested in things that are particularly concrete, uh, like IQ, for example. Um, and so they spend a lot of time actually having to assess how reliable their results or how reliable their level of measurement actually is. And they do that in different ways. Okay, so the first way of actually assessing reliability is by doing something called a test retest. Now it is essentially exactly what the name of it suggests. You administer the same test or questionnaire to the same person or people on different occasions. A reliable measure or a reliable test should give you the same or at least very similar results both times. It is at this stage worth mentioning that this method is mostly used with questionnaires or tests like IQ tests, but it can also be used for interviews as well. Now, there has to be enough time between a test and a retest, long enough for you not to remember your previous answers but also not so long that people's attitudes may have changed. In the case of questionnaires and tests, the results of the original test and the retest are then compared and correlated. If the correlation is significant and positive, then the reliability is assumed to be good. Reliability is assumed to be good if the correlation is at least positive 0.8. Okay. Now, the other way of assessing reliability is known as inter-observer reliability. Inter-observer reliability essentially means that when you're conducting an observation, observers should work in teams of two. They should watch the same event and record their observations separately, and then when they're done, they should compare their results, correlate their results to find out whether there is a positive correlation, and if there is, 
and that correlation is significant, then they can argue that it is reliable. Now, this comes down to the issue that everybody has their own view of the world, which is a massive problem for observational research, because one researcher may interpret events differently to another because of this issue of a subjectivity bias. So it should never be just one person observing something. It should always have two. And if at the end, both observers come out and they don't find they've got a strong positive correlation in terms of what they've observed, then maybe they haven't done something properly. That means that maybe their behavioral categories aren't operationalized properly. Maybe they're a little bit too vague and people are interpreting or misinterpreting what they've seen. Okay, so usually what tends to happen is, is that observers actually conduct a small-scale pilot study first just in order to establish that observers are actually applying the same behavioral categories in the same way. Okay, so that is inter-observer reliability. And again, the rule of 0.8, positive 0.8 is applied. It's also worth mentioning at this point as well that similar methods would apply to other forms of observations. So you've got content analysis, for example. Here, instead of it being called inter-observer reliability, it would be called inter-rater reliability. And you can also use it in interviews where it's known as inter-interviewer reliability. But it works in exactly the same way. Okay. So moving on, how do we actually improve the reliability of a study? So if you are conducting or if you are using questionnaires, um, as we saw earlier, the reliability of questionnaires should over time be measured using the test-retest method. A questionnaire that produces a low test-retest reliability may need some items to be deselected or rewritten. For example, if some questions are too complex or too ambiguous, they may be interpreted or misinterpreted differently by the same person on different occasions. So one solution might be to replace the open question with closed questions or with fixed choice alternatives, which may be a little bit less ambiguous and they might leave a little bit less room for interpretation. If you're doing an interview then probably the best way of ensuring reliability is to use the same interviewer each time. If that's not possible or practical then you need to make sure that all interviewers have been properly properly trained. For example you don't want one particular interviewer to start using leading questions or ambiguous questions. So you need to make sure that everybody has had the same training so that everybody knows what type of questions to ask and how to ask them. That's more easily avoided in a structured interview. Okay, so that they usually have better reliability because that's an interview that's more controlled by fixed questions. Um, interviews that are unstructured and more free-flowing are less likely to be, to be reliable by comparison. If you are conducting an experiment, um, then really lab studies are the way to go. Lab studies are very often described as being reliable because the researcher can exert strict controls over many aspects of the procedure, such as the instructions that the participants receive and the conditions in which they're tested. It is much easier to achieve that level of control in a lab experiment than in a field study, for example, and having that level of control can increase the reliability of your study because one thing that might affect the reliability of the finding is if participants are tested under slightly different conditions every time they're tested. So having the conditions nice and strict means that the conditions are always going to stay the same, which is going to improve your reliability. Okay, and then the final type of study is observations. 
and reliability of observations can be improved by making sure that behavioural categories have been properly operationalised and that they're measurable and self-evident. For example, if you are observing aggressive behaviour, having aggression as a behaviour category wouldn't be great. However, having pushing would be a little bit more measurable and a little bit more self-evident for everybody. Categories shouldn't overlap, for example, snuggling and hugging or hugging and cuddling. And all possible behaviours should be covered on the checklist. If the categories are not operationalised well, or if they overlap, or if there are certain behaviours that are absent, then different observers might have to make their own judgments of what to record, and they may well end up with differing and inconsistent records, which is going to reduce your reliability. Okay, that is the end of part one, and I hope that everything made sense. The next video is going to pick up where this one left off and is going to look at explaining, assessing and improving validity. Okay, thank you very much for listening and I hope it's been useful.